Today we've got uh, Viv Kendon, uh, who's in Durham in the UK in um, work from home uh, with a much better uh, virtual background than I have. Uh, she has paintings and I have a window. Um, oh, mine, so mine, ha mine has real-time ray-traced graphics, my virtual background. Um, <laughs> I've optimised it heavily. Uh, but um, Viv and I first met uh, way back when I uh, was sort of uh, beginning my first postdoc, where back in the days, uh, discrete quantum walks were all the rage and everybody was talking about them as a way of doing optical quantum computing. And Viv and I had very overlapping interests in that. Viv did some of the foundational papers in uh, first discrete time quantum walks and then uh, um, continuous time quantum walks, which I think is what's going to be leading into what she's talking about today, uh, generalizing into, into uh, continuous systems, which I think follows on from that earlier field of research. So uh, we're looking very uh, much forward to hearing uh, what's happened in the meantime. Um, and uh, Viv, if you need anything, uh, I'll be back on at the end and when we have questions, otherwise I'll leave it over to you. Okay, I need to get my screen sharing up again. Um, there we go. Um, let's not share my inbox. Let's get the talk up. Um, that should be looking good, guys. Hopefully you've got that there. Um, great. Well, thank you for inviting me to give this talk um, across the time zones. It's a pleasure. Um, given um, I'm normally up at this time of the morning, just not uh, normally giving a talk at this time of the morning. Um, so while we're on the opening slide, I'm going to do a quick introduction of uh, the group here. Um, I'm part of the much bigger research section, Quantum Light and Matter, which is mostly experimentalists. Um, and within that, um, we've got Nick Chancellor, who is, was my postdoc and is now an innovation fellow. Um, so he has a postdoc, Ji Chen, and a student, Laura Nita. Um, and if you Google Quarks Interactive, you will find um, a games company um, with an educational game teaching quantum in, uh, mechanics, teaching quantum theory. Um, then um, from January, Adam Stokes is going to join us to do some open systems work. Um, and there's a string of PhD students that have been involved in the work I'm going to talk about. James Morley um, was at the UCL PhD. He's now working for a startup called Counting Labs based in Reading. Uh, Adam is writing up now, um, has done a lot of the work I'm going to talk about. Uh, and Gemma and Steph are just starting their second year and I'll maybe briefly mention some of the things they're working on. There have also been a lot of master's level project students who've contributed to the work. Um, I'll give them a mention when we come to their stuff. Um, there's been some funding, as you might expect, from uh, EPSRC um, involved in here in various guises. Um, and with that, let's move on and remind ourselves why we do this stuff. If we're into quantum computing, it's because we're interested in increasing the computing power we have available. Um, but we also have to remember that our current computers, our classical ones, are very powerful already. Um, the issue is not so much what they, can, what they can't do, but that we can't make them faster. Um, we're reaching the limits of what we can do with silicon chip technology. Um, and which is very topical right now, we also have an energy consumption problem. They are far from optimal in the way their energy use works. And there are, these big data centers are being a significant percentage of global human energy consumption. Now, there are ways to reduce um, energy use in silicon technology by really redesigning sort of architectures. There's an example in the Spinnaker project. Um, but that in itself is not necessarily give, going to give us the boost in computing power. It'll give us more computing for the same power, but not necessarily faster. Um, and the reason for these limits are basic physics, um, heat conduction of silicon, we can't cool the chips any faster than we currently do. And that puts a limit on how fast they can operate. 
Um, so, of course, there's lots of stuff people are researching beyond silicon, and not just quantum. Um, that's uh, um, this is just a sort of random selection of some of the wackiest stuff out there that people are doing experiments on. Um, so there's a lot of um, neuron-inspired neuromorphic computing um, or interfacing cells with silicon, which is what's going on here to understand how they work. Um, you can compute with slime mold, with liquids, with chemical reactions. Um, this is a gob of um, carbon nanotubes in resin um, and their conducting and semiconducting properties are being used to make something with a lot of electrodes that um, then be behaves like a, an analog computer. Um, and there's lots of ways to in, uh, compute with DNA. Um, this is just illustrating a possible way to do an encoding with the base pairs. So what's happening with computing in future is it's diversifying. Um, but that also means we need to co-design algorithms to use this hardware because you can't um, just go, okay, same programming language, compile it down onto the hardware. That's not how this stuff works. And that includes the, the, the quantum, of course. Um, another thing that's worth noting is that in practice, what we do all the time is we use coprocessors and we have done for decades. Um, graphics card to control how the screen is drawn um, so that it's fast enough in real time, that's been standard for a long time. Um, there are also um, ASICs, FPGAs, um, um, and the chips in most devices are um, pretty uh, optimized to the type of device, desktop, mobile phone, whatever. And the same is true if you are actually using one of these unconventional sub, um, com uh, computing methods. Um, you'll have a control system that will be a, a standard classical computer and you'll have your substrate that's doing something more interesting. So this is the norm in practice in the lab. Um, but the theories we have are single paradigm. We have a Turing machine theory for classical computing that looks nothing like the silicon we actually use. Um, analog has its theory um, in Shannon's general purpose analog computer. Um, quantum has a whole bunch um, Turing machines, continuous variable, measurement-based, um, quantum walks, adiabatic, um, and there are things in between, uh, like linear optics, um, which has a different computing power. So, but what we are lacking is the theory that really puts these together and says, what can you do if you have combinations? What can you do if you have coprocessors in there? The other thing is useful to recall is if we're doing computing with something really wacky and unconventional, we better make sure we are actually doing computing with it and not doing experiments or something else. Um, so this is, um, I'm just going to do one slide on this. This is my um, outreach version of the slide with the pretty pictures. Um, but there is a, a serious diagrammatic version of it in starting with this paper and a series of of papers after that. Um, so if we have our computing problem, what we need to then do is encode it so that it fits on the hardware we intend to use. Um, and then we need to actually set up the hardware, write our program on it, um, and press go to run the program, or equivalent, depending what that is for the hardware. There'll be some change of state as the program runs, and we then won't get to observe it, read the output, and then we have a decode step um, to get a result back in the same language of the problem. In other words, solving the problem from here to here, which is what we wanted, has gone through this physical device like this and come out the other end. So now, what I've done here is I've unrolled that diagram. So the physical device is in here. There's the input, the encoding step. Um, we have an input state. 
we have some processing we do on it that produces an output state we decode we get a result so that's our quantum computing in that generic language of what a, a computation actually using a physical system to compute is so what have we got in the quantum mechanics bit here so this is a unitary evolution or more generally it could be open systems or the environment could be affecting it um, and we can make you as out of a gate sequence or we can engineer a hamiltonian such that the output is running this time dependent hamiltonian for over for some length of time applied to the input um, now this model actually all this picture of things covers most of quantum information processing including communications where what you're trying to do is get the input to be reproduced in the output and then things are interrupting you here if you've got an open system um, but the thing to note about this encode step is that we do have some arbitrary choices here this is a, quite a general thing about encoding um, so here we could use for example if we had spin up spin down for our two states we can choose which one of them is a zero and that in principle makes no difference provided that these steps are consistent with our choice but that in arbitrary choice is a signature of when we're doing information processing as opposed to just doing experiments on, on a system. Another little note about encoding, it matters how we do our encoding because it determines the physical resources we're using. Um, so if we just think of encoding numbers, um, we could do a unary encoding where we have the same number of things um, or energy levels, say, or um, whatever, something countable to represent that number. But we can also represent it in binary. And if we do that, it doesn't look so different at this point. We've got three bits here instead of four. Um, by the time you get up to n being a large number, we only need a logarithmic number of bits to represent the number. Um, so this is important. This is actually why digital classical computers took over from analog because their encoding was more efficient. Um, and um, that was then um, gave you a reduction in the memory and the resources you needed to get a certain precision. And exactly the same, of course, applies to uh, quantum. If you can do a binary encoding, um, then you're going to be winning and it's an exponential difference. So if you get it wrong in your resources, you may not be winning against classical. <coughs> and then of course, there are more efficient encodings. If you do floating point numbers, you've got a second level of exponent here. Um, and so you're trading a limited precision um, for, again, an exponential decrease in the memory you need. Um, we'll come back to this. You'll see why I'm emphasizing this. It looks obvious in this setting, but um, it can get a little trickier when you're setting up uh, the different quantum systems. So if I was going to do the standard gate model quantum computing introduction, it would go, you know, you need some two-state systems, can, here's some examples, electron spin, photon polarization, whatever. We localize them or make them distinguishable in some way so we don't have to worry about Fermi or Bose statistics. We choose a basis, that's our arbitrary encoding that we're going to do. We've got superpositions and we apply a universal set of gates, for example, this one. And we add some error correction. Um, but why are we expecting quantum computing to be like digital classical computing? Um, we've got a diverse range of models under development um, and we don't seem to be focusing down on the one true path um, in the way that digital silicon dominates. So this I've done a little um, sort of um, 
compartmentalization of, of the different types. So we can have, here's our data encoding. So we like binary, we like digital encoding. Um, and this is our analog encoding here. But we can also do the data processing discrete. So there's the gate model um, with, um, that I just described. Measurement-based quantum computing is also in this set here. And here's our continuous uh, time processing. So we've got adiabatic quantum computing, quantum walks, quantum annealing. Quantum simulation can use all of these techniques and it's one of the most important applications. So this is partly why all of this picture is still in the game here. Um, and the unary encoding, it's not that we'll never use this because it's inefficient, because if you're doing communications and you've got a noisy channel um, you, and you're sending small amounts of data at a time, um, you may not take a hit over a unary encoding um, and it may be the best way to do it. Um, so you just need to think about what you're doing and why you're using it in any given situation. Um, but let's think about why it is that we might have a broader range of options for quantum. So bits are either zero or one, um, and you can flip between the two values. That's your choice of what you can do with bits. But qubits can be in any superposition. So we can smoothly change from zero to one with a rotation, and we can stop at anything in between that we like. So it makes sense to do discrete gates for bits because bit flip is the only operation that you have. But for qubits, if you want to do an exact bit flip, it's just as hard as other rotations. You've got to do it precisely or you'll end up somewhere slightly off. Um, so continuous time evolution makes sense for qubits in a fundamental way it doesn't for bits. Um, and of course, there are models of computing in classical uh, computing like neuromorphic um, neurons for, um, do a more continuous sort of computing. Um, but um, digital silicon classical computing um, makes sense as discrete. Um, there isn't a continuous uh, equivalent of it the way that you have for qubits. And this is fundamentally one of the ways that quantum differs from classical. Um, and if you look up some work by Lucy and Hardy, which I don't think ever got pub journal published. One of the axioms is this continuous transition from between states in quantum mechanics. Um, and that's the one that makes it different from classical mechanics. Um, so this gives us a little bit of just fundamental justification for why we might be interested in a continuous time quantum computing. So let's take a look, closer look at what we've got in this corner here. So there's my quantum computing slide again, just to remind you, what we're looking at is how to do Hamiltonians in here to make things compute instead of doing gates. So how do we encode problems into qubit Hamiltonians? So we've got the same starting states as we'd expect. Um, we've got a set of computational basis states, which I can write as this J for a, bin a number. And in binary, that um, the zeros and ones are what each qubit is doing to represent that state. So I've got N qubits here labeled from zero to N minus one. Uh, and we know how to write a superposition of all of the possible basis states. Um, that's just a tensor product of the plus state here. Um, and that, when you multiply it out, gives you a an equal superposition of all of the numbers from 0 to n minus 1, 2 to the n minus 1. There we go, counting here. Um, so now we to encode a problem into an n-qubit Hamiltonian, we do it in such a way that the solution is the lowest energy state, so the ground state. So you think about it as like Lagrange multipliers, we're going to add energy penalties for states that are not the solution we want. So if we have the search problem, we want to find the state M, 
then we make a Hamiltonian that in which everything has one energy except state M has one less unit of energy. Um, and then if we find the lowest energy state, it's got to be M by construction. So here's a, long, a less trivial example. If we have a constraint on three of our qubits, such that exactly one of them needs to be one, if you write this term in your Hamiltonian, that will do it for you. Um, so these are the Pauli X and Z operators. Um, and you have identity minus Z on each of them. And then you have to square it in order to get it um, to come out that it is that the two qubits being one is not also a solution. So um, if you go away and scribble with that for a few minutes, you'll see that that works. So what we can do is we can look at our problem and the constraints in it, and we can make our problem Hamiltonian a series of a sum of a series of terms that implement those constraints. And we can do this efficiently and ways are known to map a, a bunch of different optimization problems into this setting. I'll have examples later. So now how do we compute with that? Um, the most, the easiest to understand why it works is adiabatic quantum computing. So we've got our problem Hamiltonian. We initialize in the ground state of a simple Hamiltonian that we can easily prepare. Um, and what we're actually going to do is, whoops, let's not highlight that, is pick Hamiltonians that for which this is the ground state. Um, there's lots of choices for that. Um, and then we're going to transform from one Hamiltonian to the other adiabatically. So we start at t equals zero with s is zero in with the Hamiltonian being h zero and we start in the ground state of this Hamiltonian and then as we increase s we reduce the amount of this Hamiltonian we increase the amount of this one and by the time we get to s equals one we have the problem Hamiltonian applied and if we've done it slowly enough um, by the adiabatic, as determined by the adiabatic condition, we'll have stayed in the ground state of the Hamiltonian the whole way through. So we'll be in the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian and hence we'll have our solution if we measure it. Um, the question then is, how slowly is slow enough? Um, the slower you go, the smaller epsilon is, and the more completely you'll stay in the ground state, but the longer the computation will take. So it's not clear that you get a quantum speed up from this, but you do get your answer. So continuous time quantum walks. Um, this is a bit of a full slide. I've got a, examples coming later. So if you're getting lost at this point, don't worry. Um, so we define, we take the adjacency matrix of a graph which is just ones to tell us where there are edges. Um, we make a Laplacian out of that where the diagonal matrix has the degree, so the number of edges meeting at each site J. Um, and then we can make a Hamiltonian out of that because what we've got is a symmetric matrix. Um, so we can make this as a Hamiltonian. And what the Hamiltonian does is it has terms that get you hopping between different sites that are connected by an edge. Um, and gamma is our hopping rate, so the transition probability of moving between these sites. And then with the quantum walk is just um, by the Schrodinger equation uh, solution, um, e to the minus i h t applied to some initial state. Okay, great. Um, so now remember that the encoding matters. So from this slide, we want to be binary encoded, not unary. So what we're going to walk on are hypercubes, but encoded hypercubes. We're going to encode this quantum walk into our qubits, much like we'd encode a simulation of a classical random walk into a digital 
classical computer. So now here is the encoding picture again. So these are my binary labels um, and these are my, this is my graph. So I've got three qubits and this, these little things here are my qubits. So one qubit and I've got a zero one. I've got a graph with two sides and one edge. Two qubits and I've got a square. I've got four sides and two um, four edges between them. Three qubits and I've got a cube and I can extrapolate and go on for that um, to do it to any number of qubits I like. So the graph that the quantum walk is walking on is this virtual graph and the qubits that we're actually using to as our quantum computer there's only log of the number of sites of them so what you encode here is the label this is the the state of the qubits that tells you what site you're on what vertex you're on and that comes out to be a very nice hamiltonian um, that n ones, so the degree of each vertex is n, so that's my d term. Um, if we go back here, oops, two, two of these, that's my diagonal entry for the degree. And then this is the hopping term. So the sum of the sigma x's, where it's a sigma x applied to the jth qubit, it gives me all of the hopping terms for all these edges. Um, but it's, so you can see we've got, in the sense we've got two graphs going on here. This is the graph that we're walking on, which is this one in um, state space. But the physical connections between the qubits, these red dotted lines are what we're going to use to make our problem Hamiltonian. So they're interaction terms between the qubits. Um, for the inner hand, we make the other bit of the Hamiltonian we're going to need. So let's do an example to make all of that a lot clearer. Um, we'll do continuous time quantum search, um, which will be finding the marked state. Um, the problem Hamiltonian is what I said it was before, identity on everything except where the marked state is, we give it one lower unit of energy lower. Now, if you're actually implementing that in Pauli operators, it looks really horribly messy like this with lots of product of lots of sigma z's. Um, and that's not practical to do in hardware, but there are some clever gadgets to implement this, which I'm not going to go into, but you can read about them here. Um, and by the way, there's a a diagram of a six dimensional hypercube in that, which I have decided not to try and draw for my examples on the previous page. Um, so let's just assume we can make this using the gadgets or otherwise, and then we'll use that hypercube Hamiltonian I've just described for the easy Hamiltonian. The ground state is that equal superposition, as I promised. Um, and then what we're going to do I'm going to write this down quite generally so I can do quantum walks and adiabatic quantum computing. So I'm going to have some amount of the hypercube Hamiltonian plus some other amount of the Mark state Hamiltonian. And these are the, the time dependence goes in here. Um, these are time independent Hamiltonians. And we're going to apply our time evolution with whatever we do with A and B, measure after a suitable time. And if we do this all correctly, we will get that the time is proportional to the square root of the number of um, sites we've got. Big N is two to the, the little n. And we'll get our normal Grover quantum speed up for searching. So here it is in pictures. Um, so a quantum walk, we're going to set up a parameter. So we're going to sort out our A's and B's. So we've got a parameter that gives us quantum walk if, it, if alpha is zero. And if alpha is one, we get adiabatic quantum computing. Um, so for a quantum walk, we just want 
gamma for the hopping rate and a constant amount of the um, of the search ha problem Hamiltonian. And it, so it looks like this. We just have um, A and B um, set and kept constant the whole time. And what that gives is these oscillations between the initial state and the marked state. Um, and they're lower than one because we're doing this, I think, for about eight qubits, where the probability happens to be lower because there is its finite size effects. So if we want to do adiabatic, we want to get this form. Um, so um, A and B are going to look something like this. Um, so there's B and there's A. We start with all of the hypercube Hamiltonian and we end with all of the problem Hamiltonian. And if we do that, we'll see that the probability steadily increases up to here. Um, or we could do something in between that, um, and I'll show how to do that in a bit. So here we've got something that's oscillating, but is steadily rising as well. And that's, you can see how if you flatten this, you're flattening it until you get to the quantum walk. But we're missing something here. We need a value for gamma, and we need a function for s of t. So we need a, a way to get these. So um, search in continuous time is the search algorithm solvable analytically. And the method for doing that is in the large n limit, you find that the, you reduce to a two dimensional subspace, the ground state and the first excited state, and then everything else, all the other energy levels disappear off so high that they don't take part. You, you don't end up um, uh, occupying any of those. Um, so to get our um, function of S of T, um, we map it into this single qubit version. So we've just got single, single X's and Z's. Um, and the parameter here, which is the minimum gap in um, the, this Hamiltonian, relates us back to n. Um, so the, the original um, full qubit version of it. You can solve the Eigen system. It's a single qubit. Um, and then you'll get a function for this gap that looks like this. Then there's a nice method in Roland and Surf from two, 2002 that obtains a function for S of T by solving, essentially solving the adiabatic condition. So there's our epsilon. This is the, um, the, the, the gap squared is, um, I'm not sure, yeah, let me see if I can go back and show you what we're doing is here. So it's this thing that we're solving um, in such a way as to keep epsilon small enough. So you solve that, um, you get a function, and you can invert it. <coughs> and in the limit of a um, very small gap, um, this is the kind of function you get. So you get a cotangent function. Um, so that's the kind of function that we're looking at here for S of T. Um, for quantum walks, um, you get gamma um, a corresponds to S equals a half. So you get a very simple Hamiltonian that does your, just does your Rabi flops for you. And then we can see how to interpolate uh, between alpha is zero and one. This is one way to do it. So all I've done is I've taken these two different versions and I've got functions of A and B um, that give, depending on the value of alpha, they'll either give you this one or this one or something in between. So this is great. We not, now not only do we have a nice model of um, continuous time quantum computing for quantum walks and adiabatic, but we've got a way to do anything we like between the two. Um, and we can explore what that does for uh, com, uh, for solving the search problem. 
so for example, so here is our parameter alpha. So there's the quantum walk. So there's the rabbi flops um, going on here as we do time up this way. And this is the adiabatic where it goes smoothly from zero to one in terms of its probability. And then this is what goes on in between for, I think in this case, the eight qubits again. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of subtleties that I'm not going to go into, but you can read all about them in here. But the key point to take away from this is, yes, you get a speed up for any of the hybrid versions of the algorithm. It's not that the speed up only happens at the endpoints, but you need to know gamma or S of T to exponential precision. And if you don't have it to that higher precision, um, you won't get your speed up. We can also optimize over multiple runs. So well, that means there must be an initialization time that's non-trivial. Otherwise you could win by rapid guessing that didn't cost you anything. Um, so if you have a large initialization time between runs, um, the adiabatic is better. And if you have a fairly short initialization time, then um, two hybrid runs or closer to quantum walk is a better option. So which hybrid strategy you want to do is hardware dependent because it depends on this initialization time, which is a hardware thing. So you to ultimately to optimize what you want to do with your quantum algorithms, you have to take into account the hardware you're using. Um, in the theoretical limit, one now um, the quantum walk does better than adiabatic because you don't need to keep the adiabatic parameter small for the quantum walk to solve the problem. But when you take hardware into account, um, hybrid algorithms can do better. So now let's think about some more realistic problems. The search problem is a toy problem um, because implementing it involves kind of knowing the answer to set up the Hamiltonian. Um, so what we looked at for a more realistic problem um, is Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glasses. Um, so, um, The, so what this, um, so this is a, we look, chose this because they've been um, used for, by people have already done some work on them looking at adiabatic quantum computing. Um, and with adiabatic, you can find ground states better than guessing. Um, so what we have here is a, a problem Hamiltonian that's are in the same transverse icing category as the search problem. Um, but we now just have ZZ terms and then single terms for a field. Um, and these J's and H's, which are our saying how strong each term is, are drawn from Gauss a Gaussian distribution with mean zero, which makes them this an MP hard problem. So we don't expect anything beyond a polynomial speed up. But this is more like realistic hard optimization problems um, in terms of how it works. But nobody had ever tried a quantum walk on this, so we decided to try. Um, and we're also going to compare with a random energy model um, where we just choose a set of energy eigenstates randomly from a Gaussian distribution. So when you look at the energy eigenstates of this, they look almost random but the tails are not quite the same as Gaussian. So first of all, we need a hopping rate. Um, so we looked at how the success probability varied with the hopping rate. Um, and we've got a nice broad peak here, so we can um, pick the top of the peak. Um, Whereas if you look at the random energy model, we have these very narrow peaks here, which is more like the search problem. Um, what we're plotting here is something that's easy to calculate from the eigenvalues. Um, and I'll 
show later that it's a good proxy for a short time probability. So now what happens when you run a quantum walk? Um, well, you get something that looks like this, um, which doesn't look very promising for the minute. Um, but if we measure at a random time, we'll sample the time average probability distribution. And if you look at that, that settles down quite quickly to something here, which is better than guessing. Um, so this means that um, our strategy is going to be to measure at random short times. And it turns out that this has got, just gives us a log factor in the scaling, um, which numerically we found to be n to the 0.75, which may be related to the critical exponents for the spin glass, um, but we haven't been able to confirm that. Then we can look at how the success probability scales. Um, and we get this nice, really good scaling, like surprisingly good. Um, in the search problem, you have finite size effects up to about n equals 30. But for this, we've got a good scaling right from about n equals 5, um, which we didn't necessarily expect. So what we've got here is the this p infinity um, easy to calculate probability. Um, a short time um, probability, as you can see, it's very, very similar. Um, we've got random guessing, one over square root of n, which is what the search algorithm would do. And you can see we're doing better. We're about at n to the minus 0.41 for short run times. And we've used not our optimal gamma, which would be cheating, but we've used a heuristic one that's just based on the energy scales. So what we've got is a viable algorithm here for doing many short run repeats to find um, the ground state of the spin glass. Um, and averaged over um, 10,000 random instances, that's partly why, so we have got error bars on here, but they're so small that you can barely see them. Now what's going on on this one? So these two are, um, the purple one is the same as this one. So that's great, we've got an algorithm, but how well does it do compared to classical? So there is the classical one, that green one, and that's doing 2 to the minus 0.37. So that's doing even better than our quantum walk. So we thought, OK, let's do a bit of a hybrid algorithm. So that's what these ones are. So we did um, something that's a bit hybrid between adiabatic and quantum walks. And yep, we're getting minus 0.277. But hang on a sec, Ashley Montanaro has an algorithm that is essentially the square root of this. So that's going to be about minus 0.18. So we optimize this and we got something that's getting down to minus 0.15. However, that the optimization we did was cheating, which is why we haven't published this. So we then set out to look more closely at the best classical algorithms and the best quantum algorithms. But before we did that, we did one other thing that is interesting um, with this model. So rather than worry about getting the best possible quantum algorithm, we look to understand why we were doing better than searching. And that's because there are correlations in here. ZZ here. Real problems have correlations. That was what makes them interesting. So we took variants of this. We took the random energy model and we added some pairwise correlations to it. We used a gray code to do that. There are details in the paper. And if we did that, we got a signature that looks very similar to the spin glass. We also did two different ways of removing the correlations from the spin glass. Um, we scrambled the energy levels and we put it on a complete graph. Um, and they give a signature that looks like the random energy model and looks like searching. 
But for that, you would need to know gamma to exponential precision, so it's not practical because you don't have a way to calculate it. So what we've got as uh, the take-home message here is that you need to match the type of correlations you have, the way you've done your encoding, with the driver Hamiltonian that operates on that. So a single spin flip here will take it from satisfied to unsatisfied or, or vice versa. And it's that combination that is giving us the edge of exploiting the correlations. So this is a little bit of a summary at this point. Um, what we've seen is continuous time evolution is natural for qubits. Hybrid strategies work best in real quantum systems. And quantum walks can find spin glass ground states um, with a polynomial speed up that's better than Grover's search. And to get this result, the correlations are key. You have to match the encoding of your problem to the driver Hamiltonian. So I'm going to briefly give you an idea of where we're going next with um, the work with some preview results. So we wanted to know whether to make sure that spin glass is not a special case with quantum warps, that quantum warps really can solve a wider class of problems. So we tried max 2 sat. And indeed, it can solve max 2 sat. And you get a similar scaling that you get for the spin glasses. But there are sat solver competitions. The classical algorithms are much better than this. So this is something we're going to need to deal with, just how good classical algorithms are. But what we did in this case is we looked at the correlations, the three-way correlations, between how well classical algorithms, quantum walk algorithms, and adiabatic algorithms do. So this scatter plot is shows you what you get. So this along here is harder for classical. Going along here is harder for adiabatic. And going up here is harder for quantum walk. And if that looks like a messy blob, it's because it is. There are some correlations between the two quantum algorithms, not very strongly, but some. But there's very little correlation between what the classical algorithm find hard, finds hard and what the quantum algorithms find hard. So different problem instances are harder for different algorithms. And what that means is you can do a divide and conquer um, hybrid strategy where you try different algorithms until you find the one that's best. And that type of strategy is how the primality testing algorithm works and how that became sub-exponential. So that was a really big result in the early 2000s. And it was exactly this sort of strategy. They threw all the different prime testing methods at it. And by trying each one for the right sort of amount, they got the whole thing to have a better scaling. So we're doing some um, theory to try to give us tools um, so that we don't cheat when we try to optimize quantum walk algorithms. So the example I'm going to give you here is actually not a quantum walk. It's a, um, a faster, so it's not adiabatic. We're going to run our um, anneal faster so that it won't stay in the ground state. Um, but what we're doing, remember that to solve the search problem, things went into everything went into a two-dimensional subspace. But instead, we're going to look at local 2D subspaces where we're just looking at single spin flips. So not the whole problem, just one spin at a time. And in that setting, we can prove that if you do something monotonic, so where it doesn't um, have any decreases as well as increases, we won't ever do worse than guessing. Well, OK, that's not very exciting. That just says you won't ruin it by doing something like this. But it, if we, we can build on that and we get conditions for when quantum quench will do much better than that. Um, so this has been out on archive for a month or so. 
um, what we're doing then if we balance the strength of these local terms in this 2D subspace and average over it, we get heuristic parameters for quantum walk and quantum annealing that do better. So here's a linear, which is what you do by default if you don't know what's better. And then we use this method in the simplest way we can think of, and we get a, a nice curve to our um, annealing schedule. And then this is how much better it does. So we've got a significant improvement here in the, the probability at the end. So just to summarize again, to wrap up the talk, we've now got a model of continuous time quantum computing where we've got quantum walks as one limit, adiabatic as one over here, um, a whole space to put open systems effects in where you cool it, which I haven't talked about much because um, the, I haven't got met as the same results with open system models. That's coming. That's what um, Adam Stokes is going to come and work with us to do. Um, and it makes sense because qubits do superpositions and classical bits don't. We're exploiting the natural properties of quantum systems to do this. And it's also nice because it joins the models up rather than have little boxes of separate models. We can use different properties from them and combine them. Um, so just a note, we don't have enough clear terms for what we're doing here. So quantum annealing lets, gets used quite generically for a lot of uh, adiabatic algorithms where we run faster, but we have low temperature. But the, in the literature, we get a lot of interchangeable use of terms. So you have to read papers carefully to know what they're actually doing when, um, when they're using these terms. Of course, there are caveats and limitations about what we can do in the setting. Um, for the, and for the minute, we don't have a scaling theory for this model. So if you, as the more qubits you have, the more precisely you need to set your Hamiltonian parameters in order to encode your problem. And there's evidence the current D-wave chips are reaching that limit at around 2,000 qubits. Um, this is still way more that we can do with classical computers. So um, for the moment, for early quantum computers, this is not a big deal. Um, we can use these things as quantum coprocessors. Um, we can work with hybrid algorithms. There's a whole exciting space to play in here, um, and not just with D-Wave hardware. Um, other hardware could have higher limits. Um, we also don't have um, a thorough error correction method for this. Um, we can't use standard digital methods, but you can do things with quantum codes to provide robustness, and you can also improve precision this way. So this paper actually talks about solving the wrong problem. So it tells, talks about what happens when you don't have enough precision um, and then starts to look at ways to improve it. So it's Daniel Lidar's group and Birgitta Whaley's group are doing a lot of work on, on in both these areas. So finally wrap up, since we're definitely out, coming out of time now. Continuous time evolution is natural for qubits in a way that it's not for bits. Continuous time quantum computing unifies a unified framework. So you can think about quantum computing hardware that will do simulation and computation um, and um, potentially use the same hardware to do different things with it. And hybrid strategies work best in real quantum systems. So those are the three papers that came up with the uh, abstract, so you have those references. Um, a quick note on current projects. We're looking hard now at how to improve annealing schedules, how we beat, might beat classical with them using the um, tools we've developed. We're going to look at open systems and trading off between low temperature and high temperature noise. And we're looking also at some of the error correction as a route for scaling. Um, so we'll have a, a preprint coming soon on that, but um, we're not quite ready to uh, push that out there and, and tell you more details. Um, another fairly exciting thing that's going on, um, collaborative computational projects, we're networking with 
uh, computational scientists to um, work out how we can improve the algorithms they use if we've got quantum coprocessors available. Um, there's another archive paper out recently um, with some experimental work that Nick has done comparing two different D-Wave chips with different amounts of noise in them um, and showing that what they do changes the range of the search that the noise allows you to do. So this is um, interesting in terms of predicting when noise reduction improves superconducting chips. Um, and with that, I'll just tell you about some of the quantum technology coming in Durham. Um, I was stopped at a set of traffic lights and I was surprised to see that we have quantum construction in Durham. Uh, we also have uh, quantum tills here. This is in a pub. Um, so who knows what the future is going to bring, but it's a very exciting journey. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Viv. Really appreciate that. Um, so I, um, you guys are uh, listening in, you can all put your hands up or whatever it is you do when you, uh, when you, want, when you want to ask a question. In the meantime, I'm going to babble on. Um, going back to that earlier uh, talk about the MaxApp problems, that's a NP complete problem. And so you can treat that as a, as a basically unstructured search problem. Um, is the reason, and you, you talked about the, how, um, how a, a different sp special instances work better for different approaches. Um, which is, of course, always going to be the case. Um, I guess in, in general, though, if you assume that you don't know anything about the problem in advance, then it is going to be genuinely unstructured, or, or like it's a completely randomized problem, and then you get your Grover improvement. If, on the other hand, lots of real problems have a lot of hidden structure, and I, I guess that's the reason the classical techniques can become so good is because um, uh, you start identifying what some of the hidden structure is, and then heuristically kind of um, uh, address that and get and get really really good approaches for, for certain uh, instances but um it, is, is that this correct intuition for, for how these things trade off against each other the idea of whether there's hidden structure or not and you're trying to identify it um yes so well how much it's to do with um the matching the encoding to the driver hamiltonian so how much you can set yourself up to exploit the correlations um, because so a lot of work has been done using the complete graph um, because that's easier to solve analytically. But what a complete graph is in terms of the Hamiltonian over here, it's like putting all of the possible bit flip terms into it. So you'll have XX terms and XXX and all the way up to and x's and so that's like doing if you think of a is that like the Hadamard transform at the beginning kind of thinking or yeah no well it's think it's like doing a monte carlo algorithm where mm. you allow you you just randomly guess your next move instead of flipping a few bits at a time and taking the best move and classically you wouldn't do that you do a monte carlo where you flip a few bits and explore to see what's mm. whether it's improving or not and take it with some probability um so working on a complete graph is analytically helpful but it's not helpful for real algorithms um, and you see the same thing classically so classically again you set yourself up to exploit correlations um it's not necessarily a purely quantum thing here um, and so again, we'd be stupid to be starting our, our quantum algorithms without using the things we already know. So yeah. how much it's to do with the encoding, and so therefore it's going to work for problems that encode like this, and how much it's to do with whether you have um, correlations in there or not that you know anything about, is, is, is there's still open questions there, right? Um, there, there is, um, I remember way back, there were, in the early days, there was some uh, proof that uh, a classical analog computer, if it's perfect, no errors, uh, it can efficiently solve NP complete problems. But as soon as you introduce even exponentially small noise or, or polynomially small noise, then it, uh, it no longer is the case. Um, since you're talking not about um, an error corrected case here, this is just purely mm -hmm. in an in a, in a abstract sense. 
Um, I would have thought that would mean that in, in this Hamiltonian formalism, if you impose the similar constraint that there's no errors, you should in principle also be able to match that uh, non-achievable classical result uh, of being able to efficiently solve NP complete problems. And then as realistic noise introduces that fades away, is something like that replicable in this model? Um, well, think of adiabatic. Adiabatic can solve anything, but you have to be able to run it long enough, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, you, and so to run it long enough, you must be error free. As soon as the noise comes in, it destroys your adiabatic algorithm. So off the top of my head, that definitely does. There may be other ways that don't do too, but that one definitely does. And it in some way corresponds because you know you can't run an arbitrarily long adiabatic computation. You're going to get errors in it. Um, the other place where it comes in is if you knew exactly the gamma you needed and you could set it, you can see that you're not, you don't have a, a drop in the probability here. Um, but you, the larger the problem, the more precisely you need to know gamma. And again, that's going to get destroyed by noise. You can't set it to infinite precision. Um, so I think there's question. two places where you can kind of see that same thing happening that it's cheating to run, run it this well because you can't set gamma um, and you can't run arbitrarily long with an adiabatic computation. Um, oh, I so, think that was Nathan yelling in there. Uh, yeah, the I was just gonna jump in. Um, I have what's probably a very novice question um, because I'm not so familiar with this stuff. Um, but in this kind of uh, continuous time quantum walk approach, uh, mm -hmm or continuous time quantum computing approach, how, how uh, far do you, like, in what way is it true, or, or to what degree is it true that you need to know uh, something about how to solve the problem in order to optimize the approach that you take? Or, or do, do you need, in some sense, to be able to to solve the problem to some degree in order to work out what your optimal strategy is or is it or is working out your optimal strategy significantly easier than just solving the problem um that's what the that's what these tools are about um so yes you start probing your problem but you can these are quantities you can estimate in a 2D subspace efficiently from the, the Hamiltonian, the, the way you specify the Hamiltonian. So that's exactly why we did this work um, because, because that is cheating the way we did the optimization. We're looking for tools that are not cheating that might get us towards something that good. Um, so you're, if I understand correctly, then what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to optimize your strategy for a local 2D subspace mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and then ask, uh, and suppose I apply this strategy to the whole problem, does yeah. it get me, does it still get me improvement? Yes, that's what we're doing. Um, and we've got, uh, a, we've got a, a, these theoretical quantities that you can calculate efficiently by sampling from your Hamiltonian um, and, and then you average over those and you get heuristic settings for your hopping rate or in this case, a whole annealing schedule. Um, with, there's a lot of averaging gone in here to get these heuristic param parameters and they still work this well. Um, and yeah, so that's, um, so, yes, yeah, so, that, so that, that's the idea. So that's, and then, but that is, we're setting this up in a way that's definitely not cheating, that you definitely can do efficiently as a pre processing thing in order right. to calculate what so you want to do. So then, presumably, though, the performance on the overall system is then never, never as good as the performance on the, the, the optimized performance on the local subspace. Um, in what sense do you think that that scaling? As, it, as that falls away in terms of uh, performance, so, so when you go to the overall system, um, in what sense is your performance going to fall away at the same sort of rate that at some point, like 
do you think the point where your performance start stops, sorry, your optimization stops helping is going to be relatively well aligned to the point where, in any case, uh, you you can't push your um, yeah, no, I know your your kind about. of raw yeah. processing to solve the full problem, or is that, or do you think that you might get a little bit further push into like I'm thinking about this Google picture of like trying to get over this. Uh, in, into this corner is this going to help get in do you, do you have a sense that this is going to help get into this uh, kind of so let's go back era? i've gone back a slide here to the spin glass optimal gamma picture so it depends on having a problem where you've got a broad range of optimal parameters available in the first place and if you've got a search like problem that's not going to happen you need correlations in there for something like this to turn up okay and and is those so because are, i'm optimizing i'm trying to land somewhere in here this is a global yeah. picture yeah. and i'm trying to get my sampling to land me somewhere within you know so like full width half maximum will be good enough right because now we're just a constant factor off right and there's no way i'm going to be able to do that in a search like problem like this but I can if I've got a problem that has got correlations that I can exploit. And is it possible to find problems like that that are still classically hard? Or is that going to be like the, the actual... Yeah, well, no, no, spin glass is a one and, and max two sat is another. They both have this characteristic. They've got correlations. It's this, right, it's a spin glass. So frustration, like whether the spins are aligned or anti-parallel, this is what the values of J's determine it for the different pairs of spins. That's correlations. Um, and in max two sat, I haven't shown you the form of the Hamiltonian, but max two sat is all about the correlations between the variables in the clauses, right? So you encode okay. it in the same way. You get it efficiently encoded in a transverse icing Hamiltonian. Um, and, and we've looked at the same graphs. It's got the same broad graphs. Um, so okay, this appears to be a feature of having correlations and then remember, as I said, you must match. It must be, so the transverse icing as a whole that you have ZZ terms and X terms as your driver, it's key. If you change any of these, you go back to a search like problem where you cannot determine gamma to the precision that you need. Right. So, right, so this much. is, you know, there's a combination of, of numerics and some analytical stuff here, because obviously you can't, generically proving that correlations give you these properties is not so easy. But, um, but this is what is looking really promising for, for more work, is that in practice, real problems are going to... Um, yeah, I, I think I messed up. Yeah, I messed up the copy paste on this slide and I don't have all of the, the, the notes here, but... Um, That's no drama. It's looking really promising that real problems with correlations and real problems always have correlations. That's what makes them interesting. Um, are going to be the ones that we can solve by um, practical techniques. Mm. Did anybody else have any questions? Uh, sorry. Hello. Yeah, please go for it. Uh, so it's it's about the correlation. So um, the driver, the hypercube driver, is that the best one for spin glass, which you want to, if you want to do the match, is that the optimal driver? Um, yes. Um, so we started working with hypercubes because it's the natural driver to use for qubits. Yeah. Right. Um, but it, it turns out, um, so people had, nobody really got results that showed a speed up better than search before because they'd been doing stuff on the complete graph because it was analytically tractable. Um, and so we, all of these other combinations um, where we, we put all of the, we changed the driver term to put all of the, the spin flip terms in that gives you a search-like problem um, right. where you take the correlations out of the spin glass by just scrambling its eigenvalues 
that gives you a searchlight problem. So you have to have these two things matched to get the effect that we found. Now yeah. you could think that if you had um, a Hamiltonian where you had ZZZ terms, maybe in your driver you'd want XX terms. That we haven't looked at yet. Um, and I'd say 50-50, uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, but essentially we're then doing POPs models. So there is some knowledge from the theoretical models from the physics condensed matter and you'd get different types of phase transitions in these. And so whether it's going to work well to give you practical characteristics for solving them on a quantum computer, um, I'd say I wouldn't like to bet on the answer one way or the other. That this one uniquely does, def does is not a surprise because there's, there's a bunch of special things just from statistical mechanics about the way that the transverse icing Hamiltonian works. I see. Yeah, so, so do we have any uh, method to determine what is, the, what is a good driver for certain Hamiltonians? So uh, the problems that, some other problems that is not spin glasses, like the max two set. Oh, ah, no, but you see max two set is also encoded into a, a Hamiltonian that looks like this. So, so it, so, transverse, so icing Hamiltonian, so max two set. So all of classical, all of classical optimization problems can be encoded into an icing Hamiltonian, which looks like this. So you just yeah. need ZZ and single field terms, and that's enough. So they all, any, op, any, classic, any classical optimization problem you can solve in this setting. So if there are correlations, so if you have ZZ terms, there's a good chance it will work this way. Right. The so hyper Q is always the best driver to do the match for classical optimization Hamiltonians. As far as we know, um, and you can see why, because and this, that's why the spin glass is a good example. Um, so the spin glass what you have is a, set, a whole bunch of these terms and it's not possible. So what that term says, depending on the sign of the J's, you either want the spins aligned to be lowest energy or you want the JK pair to be anti-parallel to be lowest energy. Mm -hmm. And so what will happen in a spin glass is you have all these pairs and you can't satisfy them all at once. So then it's hard to determine which pattern gives you the lowest energy. Mm -hmm. So it won't be perfect, but it will be which of the, the which ones are left frustrated that are the minimum number. That's what makes it hard. Right. Um, and if you've encoded into a Hamiltonian that looks like this, whatever your problem is, it looks like some sort of spin glass then from the point of view of solving it. Yeah. So that's why the encoding step and thinking about the encoding and decoding matters. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes all the problems look like this and then potentially have the same characteristics. Right. So I guess, I'll, uh, what about the questions, the problems that cannot be encoding to say this kind of spin glass, this ASIN model? Say, for example, some quantum optimization problems. Okay, then, um, Yes, so the, I don't know the answer to that, open problem. Right. Um, both for what types of Hamiltonians are universal for a quantum optimization. Well. Um, um, and then for what kind of drivers you need. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. To, to best do it. But the fact that this is the best driver is very simple to see. You're just trying to optimize terms like this. You uh -huh. just need to flip one spin to change it from unsatisfied to satisfied, right? Yeah. So it's no, there's, there's nothing really obscure about why this is the best driver. I see, um, I see. If you flip both terms, it doesn't help you, right? Yeah. Um, um, and so, if you look at classical Monte Carlo, it will, it will do single spin flips and decide whether to take them. That's right. how it works. I, 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 I got your point. So um, I see why hypercube is the best for, for this kind of thing. 
So, and you said it's open question that is not clear. What is the best driver for other Hamiltonians? So let, let me give, let me ask you an example. Say the Hamiltonian, the problem Hamiltonian is an exponential of Z operator. Mm -hmm. Probably would be a best driver for that form. Exponential of Z. Um, so it again, I think it will it will depend what your Zs are. Whether you're doing whether you want one spin flip or more than one. Uh, <laughs> because even though you've exponentiated it, if you do, um, I mean, you've just made a unitary out of the Hamiltonian if you did that. I'm, I'm not quite sure where, um, this is where we need the whiteboard, Damn, This is where the Zoom call doesn't quite cut it compared to an in-person seminar. Cool, um, any, anybody else got any questions while we're at it? Viv, you have to get a stylus. <laughs> anybody else for now? Great, uh, if not then um, Viv, thank you very, very much for joining us today. And uh, we hope the next time it can be in person. But uh, thanks very much for joining us. And, uh, and I hope all goes uh, safe and well up your way. Thank you. And thank you for being a great audience. And I, I would love to come and visit you in person. So let's hope that's possible in the not too distant future. All the best. We look to forward you. to that. It's a second order probability. We both have to be open. <laughs> yeah. OK, let's not go great. into that. <laughs> have a good day. Thanks a lot. <laughs> See you guys. All right. Cheers now.